Dark Light Consciousness by Edward Bruce Bynum, Ph.D. Chapter 4, The Eye, Evolution, and the Pineal Gland. From the earliest days in the dark forest and caves, our kind has been fascinated by light. The great light in the sky and the vast dome of the night with its innumerable stars suggest powers and gods far above us and beyond us. When light became a fire on earth, it warmed and sustained us. Over the millennia, light and fire became woven into our science and religion. When the monotheistic religions arose and swept across the earth, the single light and the single eye became a dominant force in our conception of religion, the world of spirits, and our cosmic milieu. The history of human consciousness and spirituality is a history of our fascination with light. Esoteric references to light litter the ancient literature. In Kemetic Egypt, the Eye of Horus was the dominant religious vision for thousands of years. In Tibet, the all-seeing Eye of Tibet was manifest by an eye on the temple. Even on the U.S. currency, we came to have a pyramid and above it the detached and floating all-seeing eye. In Kemet, the eye was associated with the light of the soul and literally associated with the I within the I itself. It is no accident that we make an intimate connection between the I of our subjective innermost experience, the eyes of our head, and that innermost I, the light sensitive gland that has sunk over evolution into the center of our skulls, the pineal gland. The eye is sensitive to the electromagnetic spectrum above and below what we actually see. It is certainly capable of unconscious subliminal perception, but the trained eye can come to see into this realm. The night sky was scanned by the trained eye long before the telescopes. Its cycles observed and its patterns written down by the watchers for millennia. The eye became a very keen scientific and spiritual instrument by which to decipher the meaning and code of the stars. The capacity of the eye to track starlight was of pivotal importance in ancient Kemet. The Great Pyramid itself has numerous shafts oriented toward specific stars in which starlight is tracked into the innermost chambers. This was used specifically for the Great Initiation Rites, the union of the polarities, the male and female, the positive and negative valences that reside in the human soul, the intertwining tendencies represented by the coiling serpent of Ida and Pegala met and unified in the Uraeus at the apex of the skull in the mythic rites. The rites brought us into the dimension beyond our usual senses and into the deeper sensorium that underlies all the senses. For not only does the eye perceive the electromagnetic spectrum, the eye is our most direct access into the vibrating fifth dimension of light itself. The eye itself is a marvelous instrument. It has the capacity to subliminally respond to a series of merely two or three photons. The eye is composed of rods and cones and each have their own special capacities to respond to light emission. This obviously was in use in ancient times before the advent of telescopes to accurately chart the movement of the stars. We're concerned here mostly with the eye in its relationship to the pineal gland. The pineal gland is shaped like a cone. It rests in the upper area in the brain, near the midsection. Like few other organs in the body, it is singular, not paired, and in one of the oldest anatomical regions of the brain. It is relatively rich in blood diffusion and has neural connections with the retina that account for much of its photosensitivity. Many traditions consider it a second sexual gland. Over evolutionary development, this vestigial light-sensitive organ has descended deeper into the skull and brain cavity. In primitive organisms, we see vestiges of this eye much closer to the top of the head. The pineal gland is one of the endocrine glands that first began to unfold during embryogenesis. It is a transducer of light, a kind of biological clock that regulates the system. 
When light first hits the retina of the eye, it is relayed to a structure called the suprachiasmatic nucleus of a hypothalamus, a region of the brain associated with the capacity to coordinate with biological clock signals of the body. Fibers emerge from the hypothalamus, descend to the spinal cord, and project to another structure, the superior cervical ganglia, from which postganglionic neurons then ascend and extend back into the pineal gland. The pineal is an active, though lightly tethered, endocrine gland. It floats in a sea of cerebral spinal fluid and runs on ganglions and neurotransmitters. It was Herophilus of the ancient Greeks who is credited in modern times with discovering the pineal gland. However, we know that this was a medical fact that he recognized during his time of studying Egyptian medicine. In reality, the pineal gland was anatomically known long ago to the Kemetic Egyptians who practiced mummification and other medical and funerary arts. Later, Galen, who also studied the pineal gland, began to make connections between the pineal gland and the capacity to see within. Descartes would later formally attempt to integrate the pineal gland into the emerging Cartesian paradigm of Western science as the conduit for the divine to attain spiritual agency in the world of men. Over the centuries, as our ancestral tribes migrated and crisscrossed the earth, interacting with local climate and ecology, the pineal gland has undergone varied forms of influence. In the northern climates of Europe, the pineal gland experienced some degree of calcification. There is less calcification among the peoples of Asia and the least amount of pineal gland calcification among peoples of more direct African background. This may have implications for mankind's experience of spirituality. Some researchers speculate that there's an association with the pineal gland calcification and humankind's gradual descent into the world of both materialism and materialist philosophy. This is suggested because the pineal gland is universally associated from Descartes to Comet with the capacity to subtly see the literal and spiritual light within us. As we move more into the material realm, and lose more of our capacity for sensitivity to these realms, there is increasing pineal gland calcification. We are now at a point in our collective history where we are so deeply embedded in materialism that large numbers of us even doubt the existence of a spiritual reality itself, let alone the connection between the pineal gland and the capacity to see within. The present materialist world order is an abject rejection of every tradition in the spiritual intuition from the peoples of Africa, India, Europe, the Middle East, and Mesoamerica. Our age is currently the most materialistic of any in the history of the world. We calculate the timeless orbits of the stars, yet fail to see the eternal cycles within our own souls. This extraordinarily sensitive pineal gland, bathed in CSF, is constantly moving in the waves of this inner sea. It picks up the minutest vibrations that move through the body, the brain, and the brain core. These waves and vibrations, like the waves and vibrations of information fields around us, carry energy and intelligence. These waves are enfolded and, in some not fully understood way, are aspects of the unseen, curled up dimensions of the world. This exquisite sensitivity is largely why the pineal gland for ages has been experienced as the vibratory interface between the dense localized body below and the more non-local body and dimensions above. During certain spiritual practices, such as the Kakari Mudra, which we will look at more closely in chapters 9 and 10, the pineal gland is directly affected. In fact, the whole of meditative practice is to stimulate the pineal gland to respond beyond its usual functions. The pineal gland, sitting atop the curved spinal cord and brain, responds through vibrations stimulated by synchronized breathing, rhythmic incantations, various meditative disciplines, 
and the heart aorta vibration that is resonant at 7.8 hertz. The 7.8 hertz cycle is the Schumann resonance frequency, as discussed in Chapter 1, created when an electromagnetic wave moves around the Earth's surface, reflecting on and off the ionosphere above in a serpentine motion. When the heart aorta system comes into resonant affinity with the system established within the brain cavities, there's a radical synchronization or entrainment phenomenon which profoundly affects consciousness. When meditative discipline helps bring the practitioner into focus on the space slightly above the head, it is projecting and vibrating this awakening process upward in a cone-shaped fashion. This is the origin, we believe, of those practices where we see people, statues, and dances attempting to whirl and spin the energy upward above the head. This is evident in Dogon statues, Sufi whirling dervish dancing, and tantric mandalas of deities above the Sahasrara, to name but a few.